Thank you for joining us today for another presentation of Let the Bible Speak with your speaker, Brett Hickey. Welcome to Let the Bible Speak. We pick up where we left off last week on the second coming of Christ by noticing three excerpts from books supposedly based on this great event. Number one, cars suddenly unmanned, careen out of control. Terrified people watch their loved ones vanish before their eyes. Some say it's an alien invasion, but Rayford Steele knows that his wise warning has come true. Christ has raptured his church, and Rayford has been left behind in a world without God's people. Excerpt number two. God's people have vanished from earth, and Antichrist Nikolai sits on the throne of power. The six seals prophesied in Revelation are being fulfilled one by one. The only hope for those left behind is the tribulation force. Rayford Steele, Buck Williams, and other post-rapture believers committed to sharing the truth of Christ. Excerpt number three. With action spanning the entire globe and drama involving everyone on the planet, a riveting thriller chronicles the lives of those left behind after the rapture. As the book opens, the Antichrist mistress is in turmoil over her illegitimate pregnancy. Satan falls from heaven and opens the bottomless pit to release Apollyon and his plague of locusts. And the tribulation force travels to Israel for a conference of witnesses that leads to his showdown with Nikolai Carpathia. These excerpts come from three of the 16 novels in the Left Behind series by Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins. The books claim to be based on biblical prophecies from Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Revelation that promote a doctrinal viewpoint on the end times involving the rapture, the Antichrist, the Tribulation, and the Millennium. One book in the popular series was a New York Times number one bestseller the first week after its release. Seven in the series have been on the number one bestseller list for the New York Times, USA Today, and Publishers Weekly. And four different novels held the top four spots on the New York Times bestseller list at the same time. Total book sales? over 60 million. There's also been three Left Behind movies, video games, CDs, and a series of 40 books for teens. The big question is, do these books accurately portray biblical events, or has this series left the truth behind as the money keeps rolling in? Major premillennialist doctrines Involve the rapture, the tribulation, the millennium, the Antichrist, the so-called battle of Armageddon, and the restoration of the promised land to Israel. Recent geopolitical events in the Middle East have stoked the fires of enthusiasm for these doctrines. This morning, we evaluate, in light of Scripture, elements of this doctrinal theory. But first, we have a song. There's a happy land of promise over in the great beyond Where the saved lovers shall sing the glory share Where the souls of men shall enter and live on forevermore Everybody will be happy over there Everybody will be happy over there Everybody will be happy over 
you've seen the bumper sticker that says, warning, in case of the rapture, this car will be unmanned. Another, if this vehicle comes to a sudden stop and the driver disappears, you have been left behind. These summarize the theology behind the rapture, namely that at Jesus' second coming, he will beam up his followers to heaven and leave everyone else on earth. There are a number of variations on premillennialism, pre-tribulation, mid-tribulation, post-tribulation, pre-wrath rapture and partial rapture, and probably more. But we need not be an expert on any of these to see how the rapture fares in light of biblical teaching. Proponents of the rapture suggest Jesus will come back and stealthily take away God's people. That would be their version of the second coming of Christ. Following the rapture will be seven years of great tribulation, and then Jesus will come back again, his third coming, to put an end to the battle of Armageddon. The wicked will be punished, and Jesus will establish his kingdom on earth to reign for a thousand years. This theory allows for far too many comings of Christ. Jesus came to earth, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, performed great miracles, inspired all with authoritative teaching, fulfilled hundreds of messianic prophecies, humbly submitted to the unjustified abuse of his Jewish brethren, received a merciless beating from the Roman soldiers, and ultimately endured six hours of torture on the cross until he died. On the third day, he defeated death in the grave, was seen for 40 days by his disciples, Acts 1-3, including over 500 brethren at once, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 6, and ascended into heaven, Acts 1, verse 9. Speaking of Jesus' ascension, the Bible says in Acts chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, and while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So, no question, the Bible teaches the second coming of Christ. Many Bible passages articulate this doctrine. But where are we to find other comings? Premillennialists have Jesus coming for his saints at the beginning of the rapture. Later, they have Jesus coming again with his saints at the end of the rapture, when they say Jesus will reign as king on earth at Jerusalem for a thousand years before judging the wicked. There are too many comings of Christ in this belief system and too much time separating events that the Bible says will take place at the same time. One fundamental rule of biblical interpretation is that the teachings of the more difficult and more obscure scriptures must be brought into harmony with the more simple, straightforward teachings of scripture. A similar rule involves determining, first of all, the clear message of the gospels, acts, and the epistles, and using them to illuminate the Old Testament and the book of Revelation. Whenever this sensible approach is turned on its head, confusion ensues. That's what we have in premillennialism. Consider some of the clear scriptures that help us see what the second coming of Christ will be like. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 27 and 28. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. This passage clearly refers to his second coming. He will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. In the same context, the Holy Spirit tells us that men die once, but after this, the judgment. Secondly, we learn in 2 Peter 3.10 that the second coming includes the burning up of the earth and comes with no warning. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night 
in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. There will be no precise warning of seven years, 1,000 years, or 1,007 years. But when the Lord comes, the heavens will pass away with a great noise. Everybody will know it's a major catastrophe. This abrupt, noisy conclusion is further borne out by the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Not only will everyone hear that something terrible is happening worldwide, but according to Acts 1, verse 11, Jesus' return will be just as visible as was his ascension. Revelation 1, 7, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. So much for a secretive second coming, promoted in erroneous end-time theories. And when Jesus comes back, it will not be the beginning of anything on earth. It'll be the end. 2 Peter 3.10, the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. 2 Peter 3.12, heaven and earth will pass away. Jesus himself offers insight on what it will be like when he returns in John 5.28. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Remember this passage because it exposes the error of several end time theories. While premillennialists tell us the righteous, the dead in Christ, will be raptured seven years before the wicked are judged, Jesus tells us both will be resurrected in the same hour. The timing of premillennialists is off in a big way. Jesus sheds further light in the next chapter on the issue, John 6, 40. Everyone who sees the Son and believes in Him, I will raise up at the last day. Tim LaHaye and those of his persuasion attempt to squeeze in seven years where the Holy Spirit only allows one day. Notice also the use of this phrase last day in John eleven twenty four, and John 12, 48. Martha said to him, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus says, he who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. This is too important to miss. The resurrection and the judgment will both be at the last day. The lost will be judged and the saved will be raised at the last day. These great events will take place simultaneously. There's no room for seven years, much less a thousand years for all the premillennialist theories to play out. On top of this, look at the picture of judgment Jesus paints of his second coming in Matthew 25, 31 through 46. There we find all nations, righteous and wicked, gathered before Jesus, who will separate them in judgment as a sheep from goats for heaven or hell. No room here for a rapture tribulation, or a thousand-year reign on earth? Another scripture that refutes the idea of a rapture, tribulation, multiple comings of Christ, and a thousand-year reign on earth is 2 Timothy 4, verse 1. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Jesus will judge the living and dead at his coming. Speaking of kingdom, we must hasten on to address more directly the question of the thousand-year reign of Revelation 20. Keeping in mind that the book of Revelation is a highly figurative book, Revelation 20 verse 4 reads, And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. 
and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. This passage is missing many of the ingredients needed by the premillennialists to sustain their position. Nothing here about Jesus reigning on earth, much less Jesus reigning in Jerusalem. Nothing here about the second coming of Christ, a literal throne of David, or of a bodily re resurrection. Only souls. This passage teaches that they both lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. If this verse limits Christ's reign to a literal thousand years, it also limits their living to a thousand years. They stop living when they stop reigning. You should be seeing the highly figurative nature of this passage. Further indications of the figurative nature of this passage can be seen when John speaks of the same martyrs who are reigning with Christ and sitting on thrones in Revelation 20 as being under the altar in Revelation 6, verse 9. Friends, you cannot read the book of Revelation in the same way you read the Gospel of John or the Ephesian letter. People get hung up on the phrase, a thousand years. They insist something significant must take place for precisely 10 centuries. It's imperative, though, that we remember, according to 2 Peter 3, verse 8, with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Even more important is understanding that the word thousand is used to represent a large, complete number without necessarily indicating a specific numerical value. Deuteronomy 7, verse 9, the scriptures teach that God keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. Psalm 50, verse 10, again, the Bible says, God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Now, to woodenly interpret these scriptures as indicating more than 999 hills and less than 1,001 generations would be to entirely miss the point. Similarly, when we read about the thousand years of Revelation 20, we shouldn't be locked on a definite amount of years, but on a very lengthy period of time that indicates completeness. While those who advance the millennial reign of Christ think the kingdom will be established when Jesus returns, the Holy Spirit says in 1 Corinthians 15, 24, that the kingdom ends when Jesus returns. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule, all authority, and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. People today have the same fundamental misunderstanding about the kingdom of Christ that the Jews had when Jesus came the first time. The Jewish leaders rejected Jesus because they were looking for an impressive earthly ruler to come with the kind of glory that accompanied David's reign. Others thought the way to honor Jesus was to make him king. The apostle tells us in John 6, 15, Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. Jesus taught, to the contrary, in John 18, 36, my kingdom is not of this world. Much of Jesus' teaching, especially the parables, centered upon his kingdom, but not that he would rule on an earthly throne. As our perpetual high priest, Hebrews 4, verse 14, Hebrews 7, verse 21 through 26, Jesus can't serve on earth because he's not from the tribe of Levi, but of Judah, Hebrews 8, verse 4. Matthew 4, 23, we learn that Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Jesus tells Peter in Matthew 16, 18, and later the other apostles in Matthew 18, 18, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This wasn't something people would have to wait on for 2,000 years or more. Jesus taught, in fact, Mark 9, 1, there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God present with power. Don't miss this. Jesus tells his audience on this day 
that within their lifetime, some of them would see the kingdom. After his resurrection, Jesus revisited the topic, Luke 24, verse 47 and 49. Repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Verse 49, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. In Acts 1-4, Luke speaks again of the promise of the Father. Acts 1-8, Jesus said shortly before his ascension, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. This prophecy was fulfilled in Acts chapter 2. And the apostles used the keys of the kingdom to open up salvation to their Jewish audience in verse 38. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Men and women baptized that day were ushered into the kingdom when they were added to the church. Acts 2 verse 41 and 47. The fact that men and women were in the kingdom, of course, is substantiated in a number of passages. Jesus, of course, was king in this kingdom. Colossians 1.13, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son. John writes in Revelation 1.9 that he was in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. This is reiterated in Revelation 3.21 when Jesus says, To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down, past tense, with my Father on his throne. I hope placing doctrines associated with a literal millennium alongside numerous scriptures in proper context will bring clarity for you on what the second coming of Christ is going to be like. No one knows the day. No one knows the hour. We're not going to get a thousand-year warning. We're not going to get a seven-year warning. Stay with us, and I'll tell you how you can get a copy of this message as well as the first part that aired last week. I see the
regular close, I'd like to encourage you to visit our website, letthebiblespeak.com, or our YouTube channel, where you can watch the full-length videos, like the sermon we just noticed. But you can also uh, tap into the one-minute videos that we've recently begun to air on Christian evidences. Evidence that the Bible and science do not conflict, that the Bible, God, God's Word are in harmony with true science. Thank you for watching Let the Bible Speak. If you'd like to get a copy of number 1473, The Second Coming, Part 2, or Part 1, number 1472, we hope you'll reach out to us. We also offer the Truth Freeze Bible course that you can complete at home. We welcome your comments and questions on this or any other Bible topic. Finally, we echo the sentiment of the Apostle Paul when he wrote in Romans 16, verse 16, the churches of Christ salute you. Until next week, goodbye and may God bless you.